Psychological horror is an artistic exploration of the uncanny. One of the most prevalent subjects this subgenre deals with is the loss of identity. For instance, are you leading a secret double life? Have you ever been mistaken for someone else? Or accused of crimes you didn't commit? Maybe you have an evil twin living in the attic. Or perhaps you are the evil twin. Today, I want to talk about a film which inspired both psychological studies and the German Expressionist cinema of the 1920s. This is 100-Year-Old Movies. The Student of Prague is a 1913 German horror film. It was co-created by director Stellan Rye, poet and author Hans Heinz Ewers, and actor Paul Wegener. It was shot at Babelsberg Studio in Prague, founded the previous year and still operating today. Hundreds of films have been shot there, from Fritz Lang's Metropolis in 1927 to The Matrix Resurrections by Lana Wachowski in 2021. The Student of Prague tells of a Faustian pact resulting in a sinister doppelganger, an idea inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's story, William Wilson. We're introduced to a broke college student, Baldwin, who tells his troubles to a strange old man named Scapinelli. We then meet Countess Margit and her cousin, who is also her fiancé. Yeah. But she doesn't want to marry her cousin, probably for good reasons. So she takes off. She falls into a lake and is rescued by Baldwin. Baldwin goes back to his apartment, where he uses his big mirror to show himself what a good swordsman he is. Are you talking to me? Note the memento mori on the windowsill. But a penniless nobody like him wouldn't have a chance with the Countess. Except Scapinelli offers to make him rich in exchange for one item from his room. Of course, Baldwin agrees. And Scapinelli takes... His Mirror Reflection The double exposure is done so well throughout the film that it never really feels like an effect. You could easily mistake it for being done with a second actor. Clearly Baldwin has made a deal with the devil. He finds he no longer casts a reflection in the mirror. But whatever, he's rich now! Time to get dressed up and romance that heiress. This is a pretty shot. Of course, just as Baldwin is starting to feel good about things, his reflection shows up. The filmmakers use scenery like the castle with its large statues to create a gothic atmosphere. And speaking of gothic, the lovers meet secretly in a graveyard. This time the mirror double really spoils the fun. Their affair doesn't stay secret for long, and the Countess's cousin fiancé challenges Baldwin to a duel. But their uncle father asks Baldwin not to kill his nephew and future son-in-law. Baldwin agrees. On his way to the duel, though, he runs into his old self again. It seems his double has already gone to the duel, in his place, and killed the man. With no good way to explain his actions, Baldwin turns to drinking and gambling. Here, to me, is the most interesting shot in the movie. First of all, for its chiaroscuro lighting, the heavy black areas in the background contrasted by sharply lit features. It also directly calls to mind shots from Fritz Lang's 1922 film, Dr. Mabuse, the Gambler. Mabuse is a criminal character who often changed his identity, eventually going mad, so it connects with this film thematically as well. The other men all leave, and Baldwin is confronted by his double once more. He leaves haunted, unable to face himself. He goes to beg the Countess's forgiveness for killing her fiancé, and she seems ready to continue their relationship. Unfortunately, she noticed that he doesn't have a reflection. Probably thinks he's a vampire. 
If that wasn't freaky enough, his double appears, and that proves too much for her. Baldwin, bravely, runs away. But wherever he goes, his double is there waiting for him. You can't run away from yourself, after all. The way they photograph the city streets and the architecture blends again to the gothic atmosphere. It begins to have that look and feel of the universal horror movies from the 30s and 40s. There's a good gag here where he takes a coach and the driver turns out to be his double. Kind of like how Count Orlock turns out to be the coach driver in Nosferatu. Baldwin gets his pistol and prepares for a showdown with his double. This is a bit of a nitpick here, but since the beginning of this movie, they've stressed what a great swordsman he is. I think it would have been more fitting if he had a sword fight against his double. A missed opportunity, perhaps. At the shot, the double disappears. Is he saved? No, predictably, when he harmed his double, the wound was inflicted upon himself. Scapinelli returns and gleefully tears up the contract over Baldwin's body. It ends with an eerie shot of the double seated on Baldwin's grave with a crow glaring at the audience. Not only was the film a commercial success in Germany, it was treated to a greater level of critical assessment than the new medium of film had seen before. It was discussed as a work of art. To understand why, we need to get into some psychology. Without a doubt, the doppelganger suggests an internal rather than an external crisis at the heart of the story. Baldwin's double is visually presented as an external threat, and yet its actions affect the mind and conscience of the protagonist. When it kills, Baldwin not only takes the blame, but feels guilty as well. It's a part of his identity that he can't control. This would naturally appeal to the field of psychoanalysis, the practice of which was fairly new, developing in the late 1800s, and by this time gaining popularity due to the work of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. A review of the film by Otto Rank appeared in Freud's academic journal, Imago. Freud would write about horror and the doppelganger years later in his essay, The Uncanny, published in 1919. Psychoanalysis gave people a new lens through which they might interpret or reinterpret art and literature, and with the student of Prague, it was being applied to film. Germany, since the country's unification less than 50 years earlier in 1871, was showing signs of undergoing societal change. The movie's undercurrent themes reflected their own struggle with cultural identity. It makes sense that following World War I and the collapse of the German Empire, German filmmakers would look back to this movie as an influence for the cinema of the Weimar Republic. Actor Paul Wegener would star and direct the Golem Trilogy, of which only the final film survives. He also starred in silent German horror films The Magician, Svengali, and Alron. Alron was based on a novel by Hans Heinz Ewers, who wrote the script for The Student of Prague. John Gatot, who played Scapinelli, would go on to play the Van Helsing character in F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu. Beyond Germany, doppelgangers have been the subject of numerous dark and critically acclaimed films over the years. From the Cold War paranoia of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, to the films of David Lynch, to recent thrillers like Black Swan and Us. Identity is also a major recurring theme in the films of Alfred Hitchcock. From mistaken identity to a killer with dual identities. And I would be remiss not to mention the countless adaptations of Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Due to their psychological aspects, these films can be deeply unsettling. The Student of Prague became more than just a sideshow distraction. It tapped into a subconscious itch that needed to be scratched. It was an unintentional prototype, 
a precursor for what was to come, and in the scope of its influence, it still haunts us today. I'm Movie Cyclops. Thank you for watching this video and supporting my endless fascination with movie history. If you would like, you can now follow my Instagram and Threads accounts. More information in the description below.